Hello, my name is Dr. Bonnie Key, and I'm the editor in chief of Jack Cardio Oncology. Today, I am joined by Dr. Michael Fradley. He's an associate professor of clinical medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and he's the medical director of cardio oncology here at Penn. And he also is an electrophysiologist. Dr. Fradley is the lead author of an important short form primer featured in our September 2021 special focus issue on radiation and cardiovascular disease in Jack Cardio Oncology. This primer is entitled, How to Manage Patients with Cardiac Implantable Electronic Devices Undergoing Radiation Therapy. Welcome, Mike. Thanks so much for joining me to talk about this really important topic. Thank you so much for the invitation, Bonnie. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks so much for your really excellent primer, which I know everyone will find really important and impactful in their practice. So first tell me, why is this topic so important? Well, I think that there's a few reasons why this is an important and a timely topic. So as you know, and as our readers know, the estimated global burden of cancer is increasing. And really by 2030, we're expecting more than 21 million people to have cancer. At the same time, the number of cardiac implantable devices uh, being inserted every year is increasing. And right now it's estimated that in the United States alone, 700,000 new pacemakers are being implanted and around 200,000 ICDs are being implanted. So you can imagine that with this increasing burden of cancer and the fact that 50% of patients who have cancer are going to need radiation therapy as a part of their treatment plan, there's going to be a lot of individuals that will also have devices. And trying to understand how to manage those patients so that we can effectively give them radiation, but also do it safely in a way that doesn't impact their devices is incredibly important. Certainly, Mike, can't agree more. So tell us, what is your approach to managing this? Sure, so um, in our primer, we have a, a, an algorithm that we've set forth to try and help people in as simple a way as possible provide optimal care for, for patients. And I think at the most basic level, it really is meant to be a, a multidisciplinary interaction between radiation oncologists, electrophysiologists if they're available, uh, cardio-oncologists if they're available, and general cardiologists to make sure that we're managing these patients as effectively as possible. And what we've tried to do is separate out patients that we consider higher risk who need more monitoring, and then the lower risk patients who don't perhaps need as much, uh, need as much monitoring and can uh, have their radiation treatments pretty simply. Great. I really like the practical, simple approach that you're proposing. Tell me a little bit about the evidence uh, and the expert consensus that you developed in order to support this type of approach. Absolutely. So we brought together for this, uh, this document individuals from the ACC Electrophysiology Leadership Council, as well as from the ACC Cardio-Oncology Leadership Council, um, and really use the expertise of those individuals to come up with some of these, uh, some of these comments. And from also the already published consensus documents that exist, such as the document from the Heart Rhythm Society and the very important document from the AAPM TG203 document. So that's where most of these recommendations are coming from. And I think that there's a few key points that we really wanted to highlight and make sure that readers and practitioners recognize um, when uh, dealing with these patients. So first of all, when it comes to the high risk group, one of the most important things to remember is that uh, high neutron contamination seems to be the most damaging to devices and that's um, associated with high beam energy. Um, additionally, a higher cumulative dose can also impact devices, but really it's those neutrons that we need to be most concerned about. The second issue I think that is important to recognize has to do with device relocation. And in general, 
it's not recommended with the exception of situations in which effective delivery of radiation is impacted by the device itself. And if a situation arises in which a device needs to be potentially relocated, it really is essential to do this in a shared decision-making approach with the patient, the radiation oncologist, and the cardiology team taking care of the patient. And finally, we really wanted to highlight the importance of leveraging remote monitoring for both our high-risk and our low-risk patients. Um, as you know, remote monitoring has become an important part of device management. And I think it's especially important for our patients with cancer because remote monitoring will minimize the number of times that they're having to come to additional and extra appointments. And our cancer patients are already burdened with a lot of uh, clinic visits. And two, it allows us to be mindful of the global burden, uh, I'm sorry, the, the global pandemic that we have right now with COVID-19 and the need to be mindful of reducing exposure for, for, for patients. Excellent, excellent point, Mike. Um, couldn't agree more in terms of putting the patient at the center and really serving the patient to the best of our abilities and the collaboration that really is fundamental to cardio-oncology between cardiology, oncology, and also the patient. Excellent primer. And Mike, I just wanna thank you for your great work, all of your leadership in cardio-oncology. It's a true pleasure to publish this primer and I would encourage all of our community to read this in our September, 2021 issue of Jack Cardio-Oncology. Thank you. Thank you.